Welcome to The Free Will Show, a podcast that provides a beginner-friendly introduction to free will while also exploring cutting-edge developments on the topic. I'm Taylor Sear. And I'm Matt Flummer. In this episode, we talk with Justin Coates about the nature of ambivalence and arguments for and against it. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to introduce Justin Coates, who's professor of philosophy at the University of Houston. Justin has published several papers on topics that will be of interest uh, to our regular listeners, uh, including manipulation arguments, degrees of moral responsibility, and ethics of blame. He's the co-editor with Neil Tognazzini of a volume called Blame, Its Nature and Its Norms, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2012. Uh, And Justin and Neil have also written the entry on blame for the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which we highly recommend. Uh, Justin is also the author of the recent book, In Praise of Ambivalence, published by Oxford University Press in 2023. And he's agreed to talk about some of the ideas covered in that book on the podcast today. So thanks for joining us, Justin. Welcome to the show. Could you start by telling us and our audience a bit about yourself, your work, and how you came to be interested in working on issues related to free will, moral responsibility, and agency? Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it being on and what you guys are up to. Um, so I came to be interested in issues of free will, uh, primarily, uh, you know, through, you know, courses I took in college, um, uh, on, uh, in philosophy, the first, the, the absolute first experience I had talking about philosophy, I didn't know it was called philosophy. Then I didn't know what it was, was, uh, with a friend after school one day, uh, we were at Arby's. What a good decision. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I think he had just converted to a fairly austere form of Calvinism. And he was telling me there was no such thing as free will. And um, I just rebelled against that. I, <laughs> I didn't know what free will was. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know what it consisted in. But it seemed to me that, um, uh, of course, of course, uh, I'm free uh, and, um, you know, responsible for my actions. And so when I got to college and discovered that they would they would let you major in arguing about this stuff, you know, <laughs> sign me up. And yeah. here we are. So yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. As Taylor mentioned, you recently published a book about ambivalence. Could you start by describing what ambivalence is and maybe lay out some paradigm cases? Yeah. So. As I understand it, ambivalence is a particular type of um, practical conflict that we experience. Um, it's a particular type of, um, or, or it's associated, I think, with dilemmas. So um, we often experience ambivalence when we're faced with a choice between what seem to us to be two very attractive options uh, or seem to us to be very unattractive options, mm-hmm. right? Right. Um, specifically, I think that ambivalence is not just any conflict that we experience. It's not the conflict we experience when we're trying to decide, um, between, uh, tiramisu and cheesecake at the end of a nice meal. I think instead it's a kind of conflict that, uh, implicates the deepest part, um, of, of who we are as agent. Um, so it implicates what we care about, what we love, what matters to us, what we're invested in, the projects we identify with, and so forth. Um, so it's a conflict between those aspects of who we are. Um, in the literature, people call this um, um, internal uh, states, uh, meaning that they uh, belong to the agent, they speak for the agent, they're representative of who she is at a really fundamental level. And it's a conflict that we typically experience as being irresolvable without a certain kind of evaluative remainder. And by evaluative remainder, what I mean is that um, um, there's sort of a no, no, no win situation or there's sort of a, a no win without losing something of value mm-hmm. um, way of resolving the conflict. So in the book, I give a, a number of cases that I take to be paradigmatic. Some cases of ambivalence are very paradigmatic from literature. So the case of Agamemnon and Greek tragedy, um, where he's forced to choose between murdering his daughter and successfully uh, fulfilling Zeus's command to go to war against the Trojans. Um, 
Or uh, I used the case of Dimsdale and the Scarlet Letter, which you know you probably remember from eleventh grade English. Um, uh, <laughs> so in in that book, we we meet Dimsdale, and he is very much, um, dis- despite the sins that we come to learn he's committed, is very much faithfully committed to God and to his role um, as uh, the town um, pastor. But uh, he also very much loves. Hester and their daughter Pearl, um, and so he's very torn with um, trying to decide whether he should sort of out himself as the man who's responsible for Hester's Scarlet Letter or continue in this role that he does strongly identify with. Mm-hmm. Um, another example, maybe more common to everyday life, that I use in the book is just the example that lots of people face as they get older and their parents get older. Um, or as they get older and their children get older, there are um, expectations of caregiving that many of us identify with, both as um, children but also as parents. Um, those, those kinds of concerns are often at odds with things that are connected with like self-actualization, right? So career choices. So you might find yourself in a situation where you have a compelling career opportunity in another city. Um, but your children are in a very good place with their education, with their friendships, and, and that counts a lot. And you, you care about that because you care about your children or you're playing a caregiving role for your parents and moving away would make make that difficult. And so in those sorts of cases, what's at issue in all of them is that really deep commitments of the agent are in conflict. And she's very much aware that when she makes a choice, um, however she decides there's going to be some significant value that's that's left on the table. That's what I mean by um, a valuative remainder. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That's helpful. So it, it seems like ambivalence is a bad thing. And uh, as you show in your book, uh, many philosophers take ambivalence to interfere with our agency in detrimental ways. Um, you call arguments along these lines unificationist arguments. Uh, we know you won't be able to go into you know as much detail here as you do in the book, of course, but we'd love to hear about each of the three types of unificationist arguments that you respond to in the book. Could you start by sketching the the resolution argument that you start with and then briefly tell us how you respond? Yeah, so before before I even get to the arguments that I disagree with the unificationist on, I, I do want to say that I think there's sort of like, like a, a nugget of insight that's motivating the unificationist position, right? So it's not, it's not uh, sort of as I see it, like um, a wild and crazy perspective to take on this. Right. I think often when you're faced with these kind of conflicts, um, you know, it's not, it's not ambivalence that is the result of, um, you know. Uh, MIT offering me uh, a, a chaired professorship and, and lots and lots of money, and also uh, uh, UCLA offering me a, a chaired professorship and lots and lots of money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's often between things where we feel like we're going to lose something that's deeply valuable to us. Yeah. And so as a result, it's also often very psychologically you know, difficult to deal yeah. with. The difficulty with dealing with these things psychologically is some evidence that um, we should be unified in a meaningful sense, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't think that the unificationists are completely barking up the wrong tree, um, but I do think they, they end up overstating the case, right? So I, I don't think that ambivalence as such is a failure of agency. It's not um, necessarily a sign of um, malfunctioning or um, an objectionable form of agency. Mm-hmm. So they, they typically... There's three families of arguments that I identify, and um, you ask about to start with the resolution argument. The resolution argument um, starts with some, I think, very plausible assumptions about the nature of autonomous action, and it tries to show that ambivalence is at odds with autonomy. And so if ambivalence is at odds with autonomy, it would be not just psychologically damaging, but it would be sort of bad for us from the perspective of our agency. Mm-hmm. So that, that argument, as I understand it, goes something like, like this. When you're autonomous, the motive that moves you to action is yours. It speaks for you. You stand behind your action. That's what makes it yours. 
So there's, uh, it seems like there must be some determinate will that's bringing about your action in cases of autonomous action. But in cases of, of ambivalence, right, what's at stake is that um, um, at least two elements, internal elements, um, two independent motivations that um, I take to speak for me, that I take to represent who I am at a fundamental level, are compelling me to act in mutually incompatible ways. And so in that case, if I don't resolve my ambivalence and uh, extrude, this is language that Harry, the late Harry Frankfurt uses mm -hmm. um, when he's talking about how to resolve one's ambivalence. If I don't sort of take one of those motives to be an outlaw, right? So he, he mm -hmm. calls it an outlaw, right? That is, it has no rational authority for me. If, if I don't get rid of one of the motives in that way and be fully behind the other motive, then um, however I decide isn't the result of, uh, you know, sort of me fully standing behind my action, but just one motive that was causally stronger than the other winning out, or at least that's what it looks like. So, um, so in that sort of case, it seems like necessarily insofar as I'm ambivalent and I haven't, you know, said, Hey, motive, motive number two, you, you no longer have any rational authority for me. I fully stand behind motive number one. Um, then, uh, I, I'm not autonomous, right? I'm right. being moved by, um, some force within me and I am not the one directing those forces. That's, that's, that's the basic idea, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what do you think about that argument or, and how do you respond to it? So I think it, one, I think it overstates, uh, the way in which I have to stand behind, um, a motive in order for, my action to count as uh, free or self-governed or autonomous in the relevant sense. So um, I think that as long as one of the motives, or as long as the motive that moves me is one that is internal, right, then I think it speaks for me. Even if there's other internal motives that conflict with that, I think um, it's, it's incorrect to think of ourselves as a set of motives that will never come into conflict, right? Like the idea that <laughs> yeah. um, our concerns or our values are um, perfectly aligned um, is not just a descriptive mistake, but I think it's it's often a normative mistake, right? I think sometimes we should be moved to act in ways that conflict with one another. I'll probably say more about that later. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the mere presence of conflict between internal states doesn't mean that when one of those internal states ends up winning out, um, it can't speak for me. Now, I do think if one of them wins out just because it's a stronger causal force, then, um, then Frankfurt and other unificationists are right. I'm not, I'm not self-governed in that case. I'm governed by, um, causal forces that operate sort of, um, outside of my control. Um, but, uh, ambivalence doesn't preclude me acting for reasons. And so when I decide to act on the basis of one of these conflicting motives, um, because I think in this context, reason is, uh, more strongly recommending that course of action than the alternative, I don't have to thereby regard the other motive as having no authority. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm still being governed, um, by myself, right. I'm still being governed by my um, normative commitments and by internal motivational states. And so I think I'm still autonomous in those, those sorts of cases. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Another unificationist argument that you consider is the affirmation argument. So could you tell us about that one next? Yeah. So, so this is an idea that I, you know, I myself am fairly attracted to. And, you know, I think a lot of people, when they get into philosophy, they, they're given a text, various texts from Nietzsche that are kind of philosophically exciting. And I think there's a very famous passage from Nietzsche where he asks us to imagine um, a demon sort of waking us up in the middle of the night and um, telling us, <laughs> not asking us, but telling us that we're going to 
um, live our lives just as they are to all the minute details over and over and over and over again. And the reason he does this is he wants to see our response, right? And I think the d predominant view among Nietzsche scholars is that what's going on there is he's not, Nietzsche's not claiming that uh, the world is going to recur over and over, but that he's giving us a framework for sort of evaluating our lives. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's one I think that's very intuitive, right? So, um, so many of us upon learning that we're going to do it all over and over again might be terrified, right? Mm -hmm. But, but Nietzsche thinks that it speaks very well of a certain type of person who's able to, um, to hear that news and then be quite excited about that truth and that realization. And it seems like their affirmation, right? The kind of affirmation that they're able um, to make about their life as a whole and about the individual decisions that their life consists in um, may not be uh, the source of meaning in their life, but it seems like um, that affirmation is uh, good evidence or maybe a manifestation of the fact that they, at least from their point of view, have lived a meaningful life, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, um, if you're regularly confronted with ambivalence, then it seems that if you were faced with this kind of scenario, right, then you may not be able to unequivocally affirm all your choices, right? So maybe, you know, Demsdell is confronted with having to choose between carrying on the secret and in so doing, be able to minister to the townspeople um, or to reveal himself and reveal his love and um, go off in shame, but also um, be able to enjoy a meaningful relationship with, with Hester and their daughter. Right. So, um, so it may be, uh, Dimsdale is a, interesting character study uh and he's deeply conflicted and and never sort of comes to a full decision um until the very end but it, it, it may be that um he decides well i chose this way but i could have chosen the other way and it would have been importantly valuable and so in thinking about my life as a whole i don't think i made a mistake but i also don't think i would have made a mistake if i had done the other option. Um, so I can't unequivocally affirm my choices as if they're uniquely the correct way to go. Um, I don't stand behind them in that way. Um, my, my thought is that having this attitude towards your life is not necessarily indicative of um, lacking meaning in your life. Although I think the sort of basic Nietzschean idea, there's something to it that um, insofar as I'm able to affirm my life, that is evidence that it's been meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't follow from that, that um, not being able to unequivocally affirm my life. Um, it doesn't follow that that means I, I have no meaning in my right. life, right? I think we're able to affirm our decisions without um, resolving or without fully resolving our ambivalence. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also think that in some cases, making a decision in a case in which you're ambivalent is more meaningful um, because insofar as you're ambivalent, you are um, consciously representing your choice as being one that's going to involve loss. And so um, making a choice where you know you're giving up something of significant value, given your, your own values, um, seems to me to be an especially meaningful one. So even if you can't unequivocally affirm it, even if you think, you know, if I had to do it again, I might do something different, um, or it would be reasonable to do something different. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not meaningful because you still, um, sort of got behind, um, one of those options rather than the other. Right. Yeah. That one's interesting. Okay. Well, the uh, third unificationist argument that we'll ask about is the argument from self-defeat. Can you tell us how that argument goes and how you respond? Sure. So this is, I think this is the most intuitive one. And there are stronger and weaker ways of developing it. The very strong way is uh, it, it comes from Plato, but then you see echoes of it. Um, you know, you actually see echoes of it in um, 
in the teachings of Jesus. Uh, there's a famous speech um, that um, that quotes it from Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, right? A house divided um, cannot stand, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a strong version of it that says, look, if if you've got this deep tension in your own volitional commitments, right? If there's this deep tension in your will, then you're just um, always going to be at odds with yourself. And um, you're not going to be stable. And you're not going to be what we think of when we think of a well-functioning agent, right? So, um, and, and maybe you won't even be an agent at all, right? So um, if a civil war is damaging enough, you, you no longer have a um, state at all, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's one of these things we all do. All, all, <laughs> all, all the philosophers listening to this will, will know, you know, sometimes we get a, a, over our skis rhetorically. <laughs> um, so I don't think that um, one fails to be an agent at all insofar as she finds herself faced with certain kinds of conflict, including ambivalence, right? Mm-hmm. That, I think, I think, like, look, we all experience conflict. It's uh, n- the mere presence of conflict doesn't entail uh, any kind of failure of agency. Um, so uh, that's too strong. I think there's a weaker version of the argument that is much more plausible, though, which is just um, it seems insofar as you're ambivalent. And you don't resolve your will decisively in favor of one motivation over the other, then when you are um, carrying out your plans, you'll still regard the considerations that you didn't act on as having rational authority. Mm-hmm. And so you'll never be in a position to stop relitigating the question of what to do. And so there's just this sort of self defeating element where. You're just going to be less able to actively bring about your goals, um, so so that it's not um, it's not sort of like a master argument. You, you defeat yourself in such a way that there's no self left, right? So it's not that strong version of the argument. It's just no, you're you're always going to be an impediment to um, successfully bringing about um, what what you set out to do. Um, because, because you're always going to have some element of who you are providing you with really powerful reasons for, for acting in a way contrary to your plans. So I think, look, I, I think that's a pretty, pretty powerful argument. The problem, the, the problem with the argument, as I see it, is it sort of imagines that when I choose um, um, to, to act on one motive that I identify with rather than another that I also identify with, um, on the basis of reasons, that um, those reasons will no longer be winning <laughs> later on, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I think those reasons, you know, insofar as they were decisive reasons, or at least you know very strong reasons for choosing one option rather than the other, or being moved by one motive rather than the other, then I think that that'll stay true. Um, going forward. I also think that there's something about this argument that sort of imagines that our motives and the reasons that we take to issue from these motives um, only support action in one kind of way. That is, they recommend or they um, they sort of compel us to act, right? So they're, they're sort of reasons as recommenders or reasons as favorers. Mm-hmm. But I think reasons... Uh, play other roles in our um, practical reasoning. I think, for example, that sometimes um, reason, considerations that count as reasons, th- th- they, don't, um, they don't favor a particular course of action, but they do put constraints on how I go about bringing about some course of action. And so I think that often what happens when we're um, faced with conflict and we find ourselves coming to the judgment that one of the motives has more rational support for it than the other. Um, the motive that ends up um, being outweighed in those contexts, I don't think it gets silenced. I don't think it no longer has a role to play. I think instead those considerations or the considerations that issue from that motive um, now give us reason to proceed in different ways than we would if we didn't have that motive, right? Right. So in the book, I consider the case of Agamemnon. Um, For those of you that aren't familiar, Agamemnon was the king of the Greeks 
at the start of this, the Trojan War. Um, his brother was the one who was married to Helen. Um, and so when um, um, the Trojans uh, took Helen, it was incumbent on Agamemnon to pursue the war, right? So the demands of hospitality, the demands of kingship, and the demands of Zeus um, required him to, to pursue warfare. Um, and through a series of unfortunate events, Athena came to, to um, be angry with him and told him he would not be able to successfully pursue warfare unless he sacrificed his daughter. Um, so this is a very famous example, and lots of people have talked about it, about you know related things. They've talked about it with respect to agent regret. They've talked about it with respect to moral dilemmas. Um, but one of the things that many people agree about is that um, in that sort of case where Agamemnon is choosing between um, leading his whole people into destruction or killing his daughter, um, there are reasons that went out in favor of killing his daughter. And yet the idea that once the reasons win, um, the fact that she's his daughter should no longer play a role in structuring his behavior or um, governing how he brings about her death, to me it seems very implausible, right? So what, what I don't want is I don't want to find myself conflicted and think reasons tell me I should act uh, on this motive rather than that motive, and then say, well, this motive lost. It's con considerations that issue from it got outweighed, so they don't count anymore, right? To me, that yeah. seems like a kind of immature and thoughtless form of practical reasoning. Those considerations, they may get transformed in interesting ways, but mm -hmm. they get transformed in ways that still give them important um, rational significance and deliberative significance. Yeah. So to me, it seems like uh, if if resolving ourself, if resolving my ambivalence means that I've I've got to come to regard those motives as no longer having rational authority for me, then I'm making a big mistake. So rather than mm. being an impediment to successful action, the only way that I can really guarantee that I'm not going to defeat myself in a in a quite literal sense, right, um, is to um, take seriously those competing motives. And the reasons that issue from them, maybe not in the same way, but in a way that really respects and honors the values that are going to be lost um, on the basis of this choice. Mm -hmm. So, so I think, look, maybe in tragic cases of tragic dilemmas, um, you know, you are going to lose something that counts as self-defeat or self-betrayal, um, but you're going to do it in sort of the most minimally damaging way, <laughs> as it were. Um, and in, in cases that are sort of less high stakes, uh, less uh, dramatic, right, the kind of cases that I think we all experience, cases involving, you know, decisions about how to um, navigate caring about your career, um, caring about your students, caring about your relationship with your, with your partner, caring about your relationship with family, caring about relationships with children. Um, all of those pull us in many different ways. Um, they provide us with really powerful reasons to act in ways that aren't always compatible. Um, and I think that learning how to see those reasons as still constraining us, even if they no longer guide our behavior, mm -hmm. um, is an important part of you know dealing with that um, and, and, and having those values, having those values that are constitutive. I think, uh, of a meaningful life, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we've been fo focusing on your criticisms of arguments against ambivalence, but you also spend several chapters of your book making a positive case for ambivalence. So in particular, you argue that well-functioning agency sometimes requires that agents not be unified or wholehearted rather than ambivalent. So can you explain your line of reasoning on that? I think that... Um, Minimally, what being a well-functioning agent requires is that you're, you exercise normative competence. I understand normative competence as a kind of sensitivity, attunement, and responsiveness to rational and evaluative considerations. Uh, you have to be sensitive to reasons that there are, that is, reasons that bear on 
um, your course of action. You have to be at least approximately accurately attuned to the uh, normative significance or weight of those reasons, right? It's not enough to know that um, um, murder is is wrong, right? <laughs> it's not enough to know that um, I would be um, violating your your right to uh, uh, life if I if I killed you, right? I need to know that um, that kind of right violation is decisive, right? I need to know that it's incredibly weighty, right? So it's one thing to be sensitive to the rational considerations uh, existence and relevance to your deliberation, but it's also important that you're attuned to the, the, the role it should play, like how significant of a role it should play in your deliberation. And finally, I think you need to be responsive. Uh, I mean, obviously normative competence doesn't require, no, no form of competence requires um, perfection or flawless execution, but w w we do want to see a pattern of um, responsiveness, right? So when you um, see reasons and you're sensitive uh, and attuned to um, their weight, um, then a normatively competent agent we expect will uh, regularly um, act on those those considerations. So I think whatever whatever else you want to say about well functioning agency, it requires something like normative competence. Uh, we could argue about the details. Uh, I'm I'm happy um, to be to be pretty ecumenical, um, even though I have you know my preferred take on these things. In any case, w once you see that normative competence is a necessary condition on um, well-functioning agency, what you're going to see is that in cases of practical conflict that agents can't resolve without remainder, then um, it's going to be important that they're both sensitive to and attuned to the competing normative considerations that arise uh, in, in their um, in their will. Yeah. So. Um, but that's just to be ambivalent, right? Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> right. So, um, so, so, so to me, it seems like, at the very least, ambivalence in cases of legitimate, right? When the, when there really are uh, evaluative or rational conflicts, uh, ambivalence looks like it's it's tracking, it's it's tracking real um, a real conflict that exists in the world, right? And um, insofar as we want our wills to be responsive to the world, then uh, it seems like. That's a, that speaks well of my will. Um, and and I think we saw this a little bit in the Agamemnon case, as I was describing it earlier, right? It seems like an Agamemnon, and this is what actually happens in the tragedy, he decides he has to kill his daughter and then um, um, sort of treats her as if she's just any other sacrifice, he he comes yeah. to treat her not as beloved, not as his beloved daughter, but as you know, um, a goat, you know. So he and slits her throat, no problem. Um, law is law, he says. Um, we got to get to Troy. Um, so, so it seems to me that that, that kind of response speaks poorly <laughs> to Agamemnon. <laughs> right. Um, and a and bit. precisely what's so objectionable. A, well, there are many things that are objectionable, but I think one of the things that's objectionable is is not even that he ultimately decided to kill Iphigenia, the, his daughter. Um, I think that's part of the tragedy, right? That for Agamemnon, it might have been the right thing to do. And yet he carries it out as if she, once he's decided it's the right thing to do, he carries it out as if she is not his beloved daughter, as if she has no normative significance, as if she's not worthy of honor, as if... Mm -hmm. He's got no grounds for regret or remorse, um, as if um, he's not quite literally destroying himself by being wholehearted in this kind of kind of case. Right? He comes to be wholehearted, and I think in so doing, that that really counts as self betrayal and self defeat, yeah. right? Because in, in in doing that, he's given up um, the part of him that was committed to his daughter. Right. Um, so, I'm not saying that Agamemnon was irrational for, um, for killing her. Uh, but it seems to me that there are better ways he could have done it, maybe in less painful ways. Um, <laughs> I think also that um, instead of just kind of going on with his life, <laughs> 
right? You know, you read the Iliad and um, which, which takes place, you know, sort of after all this stuff. And, you know, he's just um, at the beaches of Troy hanging out um, and doing lots of bad stuff. So um, it doesn't seem like it's really affected him. It doesn't seem like it's something that he's really done business with. Yeah. Um, and so I think the failure there, the deep failure there is, is, is um, evident by his, his lack of ambivalence and is manifested by the wholeheartedness he arrives at when he ultimately decides that he's got to, got to kill his daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's helpful thinking through that case. So um, we might not be in Agamemnon's shoes, but how often do you think most people find themselves facing ambivalence meriting conflicts? In the book, I, I say that it's a regular occurrence. And by regular, I don't mean it happens every day. By regular, I mean when it does happen, it ain't something you're surprised about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I don't have a uh, sort of a, a perspicuous set of necessary and sufficient conditions on what constitutes a meaningful life. But it seems very plausible to me that um, some ingredients for a meaningful life are, as I was saying earlier, there are things like self-development. And you can sort of see this in people's interest in pursuing certain careers. Um, Other forms of self-actualization, I think, matter too, right? So you see people developing hobbies. Um, But I also think our relationships with other people are very important. I think friendships are very important. I think our relationships with partners um, are, are deeply important. I think our relationships with our children and other family members are incredibly important for living well. Uh, I also think, you know, our relationships with just the people around us, <laughs> the people, um, that we may not know very well, um, are very important. Uh, there's a great Vonnegut quote, um, at the start of one of his novels, you know, um, we're, we're here to take care of the people around us. Um, whoever they are, right? And that to me seems exactly right and part of um, part of what it means to live a meaningful life. Um, but now, once I have all these commitments, once I've internalized, you know, my love for my wife and my deep love for my children and my concern for, you know, siblings and parents and cousins and also my colleagues and my students. Once I think about what I want to be as a philosopher, but also as a friend, and I think about, well, but I also like, you know, find um, it really enjoyable to express myself in these other ways, right? You know, Um, then at the very least, I'm going to find myself because I uh, am a human living a life of finite time span, um, having to make choices uh, just because of the scarcity of time, right? that are going to put these interests and commitments and loves in conflict with one another. But I think there's sort of like a deeper sort of issue, which is just like, even if I had more time, um, like the interest of my children and the interest of my wife don't always fall in line with one another. Right. And, um, the interest of my children and the interest that I have in developing myself don't always fall in line with one another. And, um, and I guess I think I can't have it all. (laughs) And I think no one can have it all. And I think, um, instead of pretending like I can, um, I need to be responsive to the ways in which choosing to spend this evening working on a paper, uh, is meaning that I'm not getting to choose to spend this evening, evening reading with my, you know, with my daughters. Um, and so that, I don't know, like those kind of conflicts, I think ambivalence is merited in the face of them. There are conflicts that are resi- arise as a result of, you know, internal commitments that I have. Um, I experience them as irresolvable without a valuative remainder. So I think they meet the criteria for ambivalence. Um, and, and I think that those feelings are veridical. So I think they're ambivalent, um, ambivalence meriting circumstances. And I think they, they, they happen pretty regularly. 
And we have strategies for dealing with them. So they don't have to be paralyzing, right? You know, you say, well, this week I was, you know, in the groove with my work. And so next week I'm going to make sure I'm spend extra time. But that doesn't make the cost of, you know, not being there tonight go away, right? Um, that's a way of trying to recoup some of that loss, but it doesn't it doesn't get that time back. It doesn't get those moments back. So um, I, th- I think the ingredients for a meaningful life typically are going to be ones that invite us to be well-rounded and, um, and not to be single-minded. And so as a result, the ingredients for a well-lived life, a meaningful life, is go- it's, it's going to be one that regularly, again, not necessarily every day or every even every week, but when it happens, it's no surprise, regularly results in feelings of ambivalence. Hmm. Susan Wolf's work on the meaningful life, she talks about like objective list theories where the meaningful life has these things on the objective list and her whole argument is that meaning is one of them. So would you say that like ambivalence is one of the things on the objective list in order to have a have the good life? Or is ambivalence just like a result of the good things that are on the, the, the list? Yeah, so, so that's how I understand it. I think um, the praise I have for ambivalence is indirect. <laughs> yeah. It's indirect because I think ambivalence is merited um, for those of us who uh, are minimally committed to being well-functioning agents, that's going to require us to be normatively competent, and also minimally committed to the sorts of things that are typically constituents of a meaningful life. That's going to require a diversity of interest, a diversity of investments. And I think when you put those two things together, it's going to follow that we should regularly expect to find ourselves in situations where ambivalence is merited. And so in those cases, Does that make ambivalence a more psychologically easy to manage thing? No, I think it can still be difficult. That's the that's the sort of nugget of insight that the unificationists Mm, are starting from. Um, But I I think um, it can be difficult. Um, But sometimes uh, that sort of difficulty is 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 not is, is is not to be run away from. Right. It's the kind of difficulty that arises precisely because we're being good agents who yeah. are mm. responding to a world that is full of valuable things to care about um, and to be invested in. And and yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I, I don't I don't think ambivalence is something that you should be. So I don't praise it in the sense of go go get yourself in pickles <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what i think is that if you're a good agent and if you care about at least some of the things you probably ought to care about <laughs> then pickles are going to find you uh and instead yeah. of thinking that uh that that speaks poorly of you i think no that 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 actually speaks well of of uh of you i like that i'm going to use uh Pickles are gonna find you is the sound like for this episode, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's a good well, line. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for this, Justin. It's been fun talking about the book and hearing your thoughts on ambivalence. Um, besides picking up the book, and maybe that's where you want to point listeners, is there anywhere uh, listeners can find your work? Yeah, so I my my work is up on Phil Papers. Um, I also have a website that I think has all the papers uploaded. Um, if the publishers are listening, then uh, I'm sure they're legally uploaded. <laughs> um, but yeah, and also, you know, people free, feel free to to email me. I'm I'm findable. Yeah, great. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank again, you guys Justin. for for having me. This was this was a real pleasure. You're Thank welcome. you. In our next episode, we'll discuss narrative and moral responsibility, and our guest will be Megan Griffith professor of philosophy at Davidson College.